I wanted to start today. Well, first let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll go. Lord, bless be with us as we continue our study of Revelation. Be with our those of our class who are unable to make it today. And we pray they return to us safely. And thank you, Lord, for bringing us together as we continue this study, as we delve the depths of this uh, incredible book and of John's vision. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, I thought what we'd do is uh, go left. The, where we left off last week was talking about the beast. Because it's really interesting and uh, rather important. Let me get to my notes real quick. Um, my apologies. All right. Um, so, so we're working on the vision of the two witnesses and. Um, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. That is, as you know, verse 7 of where we are. And uh, I use this image uh, from those, I uh, told you, the, the, the Gustave Doré uh, cuttings. Uh, and I found this one particularly interesting, I thought. So, seeing the beast is important. Uh, in this passage. It's introduced to us but kind of dropped on us by John. It's going to be much more important later. And I want to point out that this beast is not the one called Apollyon who rises up in that war scene where the locusts are and they're attacking that image. Um, yeah, there's a chapter. Yeah, and we're at verse 7. If you want to go to the reference sheet, we are on verse 7. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. It's this one right here. That this, is, this is the new one and this is days. We'll be coming to that one in a few minutes. So um, so it's not that this is the beast we're going to have a lot more to see later in Revelation. And that is associated with the number 666. And all those images we know from Revelation. But right now, it's just kind of dropped on us, kind of. Um, the appointed time, remember, times, times, and half a time, that was when they finished. That phrase, when they finish, time, times, and half a time. Um, so, uh, which is, what, three and a half years. Uh, according to, ah, yeah, here we go. Um, and I mentioned that the, if you want to look at your reference sheet here, uh, let me grab this. Uh, it's always hard for me to crank up because I've got so much here I'm working with. So, verse 7, sorry about that. Okay. All right, the older I get, the harder it is to turn these pages on. Um, So the verbal parallel of this, if you look, is Revelation, we talked about this last week, Revelation 27, uh, when the thousand years ended, Satan will be released from his prison. Um, and that's kind of in Revelation 20, that's the image that we're, that is paralleling on here. This, this kind of dropping into the beast being released against the two witnesses, okay? Um, as I said, the beast is introduced here for the first time without expectation. We see the beast no further in this chapter. It's just dropped here, and that's it. Now, it could be an allusion to the four beasts in, um, in Daniel 7. Um, let me... There it is, Daniel 7. If you look on page 8, Daniel 7, 3. Uh, and there are four beasts that are introduced. And this is what it says about the fourth beast. 
Then I desired to know the truth concerning the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And concerning the ten horns that were on its head, and concerning the other horn that came up, and to make room for which three of them fell out, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke arrogantly, and that seemed greater than the others. As I looked, this horn made war with the holy ones. There it is. There's that image probably borrowed from. It made war with the holy ones. It was prevailing over them until the ancient one came. Then judgment was given for the holy ones of the Most High, and the time arrived when the holy ones gained possession of the kingdom. So this is a, you know, in this case, the beast coming to oppose the two witnesses is very much a, a grabbing of that image, a grabbing and a using of that image. Um, and it could be a later edit in order to tie the beast of this vision with the beast in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. So I want you to go back one page to page 7. To Revelation 13, okay, down the bottom. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on its horns were ten diadems, and on its heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like bears, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave it his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have received a death blow. But its mortal wound had been healed. In amazement, the whole earth followed the beast. They worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Then turn back to page 8, if you would. Revelation 17. Then one of the seven, on top of page 8. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come. I will show you the judgment of the great whore who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the wine of whose fornication the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk. So he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. So clearly, you know, you've got here all these images surrounding this particular Reference in this in this uh, in this uh, ch chapter or this part of uh, chapter eleven. So the readers in John's time would have recognized this. They he didn't have to explain to them who the beast was. They would have known because you know it's both a Jewish apocalyptic image and a New Testament or, or New Testament times apocalyptic image. So they would have recognized this. Uh, so, you know, he doesn't need to give it any more. He, he knows it's coming anyway. So maybe he's just wetting our appetite. But he knows the beast is going to appear. And we'll get to the exact interpretation of it when we get to Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, if we ever do. By the way, repeating again, no class next week. Make sure everybody knows no class next week. Uh, because we're having so much fun, and I just want to extend it forever. Um, so the idea of who ascend, the beast who ascended from the abyss describes the origin of the beast and not an, an ascension in order to specifically fight the two witnesses. So again, this is not going back to Apollyon who arises to fight the battle, the uh, you know, apocalyptic battle that we saw earlier. This is not that. This is like the beast originates from the abyss. And of course, the abyss has you know, very many different meanings. Uh, the war that the beast makes against the two witnesses is described as a future event. He will make war against them. He will conquer them. And he will kill them. Um, so, you know, uh, it, you, you have to be careful with chronology here, uh, uh, particularly in 11, where it jumps around a lot in 11. The, it's, the vision jumps around. So, so, um, uh, uh, so you know, it's, it's just, this is more a prophecy than a vision. This is more a prophecy than a vision. We have to think of it that way. Um, for, uh, and then it goes on. For some um, early commentaries, 
the beast from the abyss symbolizes Rome. And well, Babylon, when you see Babylon in Revelation, that's Rome. That's Rome, when you see Babylon. Just to give you a note on that. Uh, Babylon has other interpretations as well, but generally, it's to be Rome. Uh, so the beast from the, this beast symbolizes Rome. So some would say, some would say, well, wait a minute. Some commentaries are, wait. If this is the beast that we see that associated with Rome, then aren't the two witnesses in Rome? But there's every indication that they are in Jerusalem, as we've already looked at. Because of the description of the court and the temple, there's, this is so, it gets kind of confusing, see? Because the beast symbolizes Rome. So there's always been an argument over, are the two witnesses in Rome, or are they in Jerusalem? Jerusalem wins the day, by the way, for just about everyone. Um, now usually the term war is not used just for two people but for a group, normally. Uh, so if you look at Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 on page 8, you'll see this symbolic image of warring a spiritual war. And you know this from Paul. We all know this passage. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand all that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever you will make, make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. There's the beast, the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So we want, don't want to take war literally. This is a highly symbolic image, okay, here. Uh, but there is violence, as you're going to see in just a minute. There is violence associated with this. But the war is a spiritual war. Paul talks about this all the time, that we are, we are called to, uh, make, to be spiritual warriors, to make spiritual war. Very martial image, okay? Uh, so, uh, uh, so as we read the passage, we discover, as we go back and look at the passage again, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottom's pit will make war of them and conquer them and kill them. So I've got kind of a, a gross image coming up here uh, that, that I want to warn you, but you're not sensitive, folks, so I'm not worried about it. But uh, not that you're insensitive, but I think you'll be okay with it. But uh, this is a photo of an actual stoning in the Middle East. And as you can see, it's different from the way they did this in the time of Christ or before. The person is anyone stoned today. They are placed, they're, they are buried up to their neck or up to their waist as they are here so that they cannot run or move. Uh, back then, they did not do that. They did not do that. They, they simply surrounded them so they could not get out. And then they stoned them. So this is what it looks like. If you're ever wondering what stoning looks like, this is what it looks like. And if you want to go, if you really want to go on the internet, you'll see tons of these photographs and images. But uh, uh, that's, what it, that's what it is. It's savage. It's savage. Um, so more than, it doesn't say that the two witnesses are killed by stoning. Which, but that's, that was a frequent fate of the prophets in both the Jewish and Christian tradition. This is, you know, uh, and this is the story, if you look at the bottom of eight, of the stoning of Stephen, uh, which is we're all pretty well familiar with. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Not, they didn't bury him up or anything. They and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down. That's how we know that they didn't bury him. He knelt down 
and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he had said this, he died. So, um, um, so we, 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 we assume it's stony. You know, uh, it, 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 it seems to be this. Uh, different, there are different ways to kill the prophets, but most of the time, it was, it was by stoning. Uh, that was their way of executing. Okay. Uh, now, it's interesting that the, uh, the martyrs, the, like Peter and Paul, we're going to see this in a minute, they were decapitated. But that was in Rome. In Jerusalem, you did not decapitate. That was an honor for Roman citizens. Yes, yeah. You either were stoned or you were crucified. One or the other. And only the Romans could crucify. But anyone could stone. Right? And that was usually within Israel itself. Okay? Sometimes, like the story of Stephen, that was not a formal judgment. That was an, obviously an emotional reaction to what Stephen was saying. Right? They, they rarely ever stoned as a formal judgment. As you see in the story of the stoning of the woman caught in adultery, Jesus was using the law to counter what the, 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 the mob wanted to do. That's how, and even then, it almost never happened because you had to have so much proof to get to that point. So uh, not only did you have to have the testimony from two witnesses to the crime, you had, if it was adultery, you had to have both the man and woman, or the two in the party, there as well. So, so it was very formal. So it wasn't something that was done very often, very often at all. Um, so then, uh, so and so that, that is the story of Stephen. All right, let's go to the next slide then and keep moving along here. Uh, if, all right, next next verse. And their dead bodies will, will, remember this is, again, a prophecy. The dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. It's not, I saw the dead bodies, as is the vision, the prophecy. Their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. There is the absolute ID of Jerusalem for where this will take place. Okay? Um, this desecration is a deliberate contrast to the burial of Christ. So if you look on page 9, at where we're at, verse 8, if you look on page 9, um, and, and this is interesting because it was Pilate on the behest of the Jewish leadership that wanted to be sure they got Jesus into the grave before the Sabbath began. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath day was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Uh, then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture may be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Uh, uh, the Jews did not want bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So, so this is a great desecration here, to leave the bodies. And not only was it a desecration, in the Jewish world. It was also a desecration in the Greek and Roman world, uh, uh, as we will see. Um, John here is speaking about a specific square. When he talks about the public square in the street of the great city, uh, and um, uh, uh, it's being, and, 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 and e in either pre-70 AD, I was going to show you this, in either pre-70 A.D. Jerusalem or Rome, one familiar to John's readers. Now, interestingly, there have been there is no map of pre-70 A.D. Jerusalem. 
That exists. There's plenty of post-70 AD Jerusalem when Rome took over the city. There you have maps, but none pre-70. However, just recently, they uncovered a street, a plaza. And they think that this public square may be the plaza that is spoken of in Revelation. Okay? Um, it's a clear indication that the writer of Revelation was a Palestinian familiar with the geography of pre-70 A.D. Jerusalem. Um, Jewish apocalyptic centered the end of the world in Jerusalem. Always. Always. We have no original maps of Jerusalem, so we really can't identify this square. However, in current exca excavation, there is one street that is a possible candidate, the Tyropian Valley Street, which served as a central market during the Herodian period. So this could be the street you're talking about. Uh, is it right outside the wall? It's right outside the wall, yeah. Which again, would have taken it into a, you know, Jesus was crucified, some say, outside the wall. So it would have been, they would have left the body outside the wall. They're just, yeah, this is a guess, right? This is a guess. But they don't know what pre-70 AD Jerusalem looked like. But the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is inside. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Yep. Yep. So, you know, doing geography in Jerusalem, is all, in ancient Jerusalem, is very tricky. And it, 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 it's hard to get accurate with it. Although the ministry of the two witnesses is placed in pre-78 in Jerusalem, John also uses the historical Jerusalem as a symbol for an unbelieving world. So here we see John using two images here. The pre-70 AD Jerusalem as the place of the temple where the, these two witnesses were dragged out and killed. But also, it represents outside the get outside the walls, if that's the case, represents the world. The world. And this, putting them in the public square, was for all the world to see. So here's where John lifts the image to a universal one. And he does this all the time. So, you know, he's writing to three cultures, remember. The Jewish culture, the Greek culture, the Hellenistic culture, and the pagan culture. So why, why does he uh, refer to Sodom and Egypt? We're going to get there. I'll, I'll listen. I even got that in here. Yeah. The term great city can be applied here to either Jerusalem or Rome. Uh, I have an image, just a, it's not a great image, but I threw it up there. But in Revelation, Rome as the great city is usually called, as we know, Babylon. And this is an artist rendering of Babylon, the image of Babylon. It's not Rome, but it's an interpretation of Babylon. But Rome is always Babylon. Okay, Rome is always Babylon. Why Babylon? Because... Yeah, Babylon because uh, it's just Babylon in the ancient world was a universal symbol of a great city, of a great city, uh, and uh, the image of conquering, the image of conquest. Uh, so Babylon uh, is a uh, has a universal understanding in the ancient world. Uh, if you look at Isaiah first, uh, Isaiah first, Isaiah one nine through ten, Jerusalem is called Sodom. If the Lord of Hosts had not, uh, on page 9, if the Lord of Hosts had not left us few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. This is to Jerusalem. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. So here we see in Isaiah a prophetic, metaphorical use of Sodom and Gomorrah going way back. So clearly, Sodom and Gomorrah was used metaphorically for whatever the prophet had in mind. It, and in this case, it was Jerusalem. Isaiah had in mind Jerusalem. Sodom, uh, if you go to take a look here, here's an image of Lot getting out of Sodom. And there's, there's Lot's wife about to become a pillar of salt. Oh, yeah. There's the city back there. Uh, Sodom was, was always a paradigm for a wicked city in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy, in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Amos, and in Zephaniah. I didn't quote, do all the quotes, but it was all throughout the prophetic image, and usually associated with Jewish apocalypse. 
images, okay? So again, it can be used in the contemporary judgment of a prophet, but also lifted up to an apocalyptic image. Um, and the same paradigm is used in early Christianity. Look at Matthew 10, 15. Truly I tell you, this is Jesus. It will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Now that town, he's not speaking of Jerusalem. He's speaking of, a villa, of, a, of any town that rejects him. But that is inclusive of Jerusalem. Okay. And then the other is 2 Peter uh, 2 or 6. And, by, and if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction and made them an example of what is coming to the ungodly. So there again is lifted up to, judge, to an apocalyptic judgment image. Okay, apocalyptic judgment image. By the way, if you read the story of Lot, right, in Genesis, it's hilarious. Hilarious? It is extremely funny. Lot is not anything like his brother. Lot does not want to leave the city. So when God sends angels to tell him to leave, that judgment is coming, Lot goes, well, can I go over to the little city next door? Right? And the angel says, no, you can't. you got to get out of the city entirely. And there was, at the time Genesis was being written, this, this polit political and theological divide between rural and city. The north, northern Israel, the north called Israel was rural. Amos came out of Israel. He's always condemning Judah and Jerusalem because they're a city. The south was the city and the prophets of Jerusalem and Judah are always going after Israel. So, so this, this is good historical background to understand uh, how the prophets would use these images to defend their own, not only their own metaphorical understanding, but also their cultural images, their cultural as well. Um, because northern Israel wanted to get back to the original understanding of the tabernacle, which was God moves with the people in a tent. And they thought the building of the temple was the worst thing that could have happened. Yeah, in Jerusalem. Awful, awfulest thing that could have happened. Yeah. Now this is way back when it was first built. Of course, that they merged. You know, they, they, they didn't stay separate. They, they continued on later in the first century. Israel is one. But when you read the prophets, they're pretty well divided up. Um, so um, uh, the city was wicked. Jerusalem was wicked. And, you know, also King David obviously was held up throughout Israel as, as the predictor of the Messiah and so on. But the other kings that sat in, the, in Jerusalem were incredibly evil, a lot of them. They were despots, the kings of Israel, such as Ahab and his blushing bride, Jezebel. So that's why I'm saying, what you, you know, the, these images have a lot more meaning to the readers who are familiar with, old, with Hebrew scripture and Jewish apocalyptic than necessarily the, New Testament, the Greek or the pagan readers, the Christian Greek or Christian from pagan sources readers. Uh, they're filled with, with imagery. You know? So it's the old story of City versus country. City versus country, right? Um, um, so Sodom is the great city. Sodom is the great city. And then we have Egypt. Then we have Egypt. And I got a picture here of Egypt. Egypt. And what are we looking at here from Genesis? Sacred cow. Worship of the golden calf. So what does Egypt represent? The world. Huh? Well, what are they doing? What are these people doing? Idols. That represents idolatry. So Sodom represents sexual sin, represents uh, immorality. Immorality. Let's say in general, immorality. Whereas Egypt represents idolatry. So you have religious sin and social sin being condemned with the images of Sodom and Egypt. 
No, it can't, but, the, but they had just come out of Egypt. They wanted to return to Egypt. So the worshiping of the golden calf was a desire to go back to Egypt and worship. That's what they did. You know, that's why, you know, you know where was Moses at this time? Uh, I'm sorry, I meant Exodus. I didn't mean Jim and Exodus. Yeah, he was, he was getting, the, he's getting the law, right? He's like, it's a great scene in the movie, right? When Moses, and uh, when Charles and Heston comes back, the tablets. And then, bam, it was the earthquake. It divides them. But, um, um, but yeah, um, the, the uh, in other words, they, when the when the when the chosen people left Israel, I mean, it left Egypt, they they were supposed to give up because they had a living God taking them forward. But at, but when Moses didn't come back down, the first thing they did was make an idol, which was the god of the Baals, the god of the 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 Egyptians of the Baals. So it represents idolatry. Um, uh, uh, it, it, and also, if you look on your reference sheet. Um, for Micah, well, look at his, uh, yeah, look at Ezekiel down at the bottom. Ezekiel 27 down at the bottom. On page 9. And I said to them, cast away the detestable things your eyes feast on, every one of you, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Okay. And then, uh, next page, Micah, Micah 6.4. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. So also, Egypt represented slavery, of course. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So, so these are the two images of the great city, are, or the great sin of the city, is that of, um, of immorality and idolatry. Okay, idolatry. And slavery as well. Slavery as well. So all those were uh, kind of rolled in together. Any question? Any question? Okay, and then of course we just mentioned a while ago that when it says where the Lord was crucified, that makes clear that the reference is to Jerusalem. Um, and this is the first time in Revelation that the word Lord, which is kurion, is used in reference to Christ, the Greek word. They, that Christ, is a, it, they used all kind of different, they usually just name. The lamb. They use the image of the lamb. But here they say Lord, okay, uh, uh, where he was martyred, or where he was crucified. The martyrdom of the two witnesses in Jerusalem is a tradition, a uh, traditional Christian view. Um, and if you look at Luke 13, 33, you'll see the connection. Um, this is Jesus. Look at on page 10. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed away from Jerusalem. So here's, here's, here's Jesus talking about the killing of the prophets in Jerusalem. And it was also a traditional Old Testament view. Look at 2 Chronicles. This is actually the killing of a prophet in Jerusalem. Then the Spirit of God took possession of Zechariah, son of the priest Jeho Jehoiada. Jeho 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 Jehoiada. I'm just trying to figure out what the accent is. He stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. But they conspired against him, and by command of the king, they stoned him to death in the court of the house of the Lord. King Joash did not remember the kindness that Jehadiah, Zechariah's father, had shown him, but killed his son. As he was dying, he said, May the Lord see and avenge. Interesting contrast, isn't it? Before the, the words of the prophet who was, stunned, was killed and the words of Stephen. The difference between Christianity and Jewish theology. Yeah, interesting, right? Right? Yeah. Give me just a second. I'm, well, not the Holy Cross, so I'm going to get some water here. I'm going to use this incredibly complex water. <laughs> Which needs two buttons in order to operate. Uh, here's the first one, I think, yeah. And here's the second one. No? Nope. Oh, that's it. Three buttons. Oh. <laughs> no, two. I could fly a plane easier than that. I didn't even know I was over there. 
you pick the top button, hot, cold, whatever E means, or oxygenate, and then you press that one. Oxygen. I don't, maybe it's bubble. I don't know. I really don't know. 03. What is 03? Am I going to Did you give us? You hit hot or cold and then you push the button to deliver. Okay. Just two, twice. Just yeah. two pushes. That's correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your patient indulgence. I'm getting really dry there. Um, so we see it as traditional OT, OT view as well. Uh, it, and again, that reinforces that Jerusalem is being, the great city being spoken of here is Jerusalem. But then again, elevated to these images, these apocalyptic images. Uh, so Rome can be the great, uh, can be the great city. In fact, it's called, Rome is called the great city. But it's not called Rome, it's called Babylon. <laughs> Revelation is really hard, folks. Really is. Okay. Um, here's the next verse, 9. For three and a half days, nine, yeah, for three and a half days, members of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. Uh, obviously, this is a desecration. Now, let's think, let's look at the images here. Three days. What does that remind you of? Jesus. Resurrected. So you've got the symbolic connection to Jesus' death and resurrection. Three days comes back to three and a half days, which is what? Times, time, and half a time. So there's the apocalyptic image. And what do you know about three days in the culture at that time when someone died? Why did they wait three days to bury someone? Not, not buried them. Why did they keep going back to the body for three days? Make sure he's dead. Make sure they're dead. Yeah, exactly. Well, the tradition was that the soul lingered around the body for three days. That was the traditional Jewish belief. So they would three days continue just in case the person would come to life. But the soul did not leave. Oh, and also, of course, that's when decay began to make itself really well known. So they assumed with the cell of decay starting that, you know, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, and I'm not gonna show you a picture of that, uh, fortunately. I, I think I'm looking for one then. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, you should. Um, the bodies are not on universal display, although it may look that way but to representatives from all over the world. Not to everyone, but to representatives. And that would make sense for Jerusalem, wouldn't it? Why? Why? People came from all over. Exactly. Representatives came to Jerusalem for legal purposes, for worship purposes. Their representatives always came. Uh, so so you, these are representatives of all the peoples, tribes, and languages and nations. That's the image. Um, and, and the scene is very much, this is really interesting, it's a reversal of the second chapter of Acts, the story of Pentecost. Yeah, look at, look at, look at, look on page uh, 20, oh sorry, page 10, verse 9. Now there were devout Jews from every nation, there it is, the representatives under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. So, here is the Spirit coming to convert, to save representatives from all over the world. And here is judgment coming to all the representatives of the world. Okay. So, um, uh, so it's kind of like a, an ironic reversal of Pentecost. Like a negative Pentecost. Uh, and the exposure of the two bodies relate to Psalm 79 one through three, which you'll find at the bottom of 10. 
O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the air for food. The flesh of your faithful to the wild animals of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem. And there was no one to bury them. Okay. So, 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 again, we see the image of exposure of the two bodies of the witnesses um, um, uh, that in, in Psalm. In Psalm. So here is John, or this prophecy, capturing that image. Capturing that image. Common to both passages. Common to both passages, both the Psalms and to this passage. The presence of the nations in Jerusalem, the murder of the servants of God, and the slain servants of God lying unburied. So this is, you know, some say this is literally a direct reinterpretation in, in Revelation of this psalm. Or it's a very interesting parallel, to say the least. Leaving an exposed body in the ancient world was done to express great anger. If you look up here, I've got a quote from the Odyssey. I know it's hard to read. I'll read it. Um, this is from the Odyssey. The first to come was the spirit of my comrade, Elpinor. Not yet had he been buried beneath the broad way to earth, for we had left his corpse behind us in the hall of Circe, unwept and unburied since another task was then urging us on. When I saw him, I wept, and my heart had compassion on him. And I spoke and addressed him with wicked words. Elpidor, how didst thou come beneath the murky darkness? There then, O prince, I bid thee remember me. Leave me not behind thee, unwept and unburied, as thou goest thence, and turn not away from me, lest haply I bring the wrath of the gods upon thee. Nay, burn me with my armor, all that is mine. And heap up a mound for me on the shore of the great sea in memory of an unhappy man that men yet to be may learn of me. Fulfill this my prayer and fix upon the mound my oar wherewith I rode in life when I was among my comrades. So to leave anybody exposed in the ancient world was a desecration and had results in the afterlife in the Roman, in the Greek, Roman, and pagan world. It caused problems for you in the underworld to be unburied. And, you know, it's the whole thing of, you, know, you see it, you see that image reiterated in modern movies, you know. Uh, you know, the, 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 the soul cannot have peace until the, cor the corpse is buried. And you'll see that in all kinds of shows and movies that will, that will show that, uh, uh, so that's an old theme, isn't it? All the way back from, to uh, the Odyssey. Uh, and there are many examples from Scripture. If you will look at 1 Kings 14, 11, on page 11. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the air shall eat, for the Lord has spoken. The image of Jezebel being cast from the tower and left there for the dogs to eat. Um, so it was a punishment against idolatry and against evil. Uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 8, 1 through 2. At that time, says the Lord, and this is the, in, you know, this is the valley of the dry bones, the bones of the kings of Judah, the bones of its officials, the bones of the priests, the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be brought out of their tombs, and they shall be spread before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, which they have loved and served, which they have followed, and which they have inquired of and worshipped. And they shall not be gathered or buried. They shall be like dung on the surface of the ground. There again, idolatry. Idolatry in Jerusalem. So certainly this image relates to Jeremiah. I mean, no question about that. No, what I mean is the two witnesses are not idolaters. But the idea that it is idolaters who are, you know, who are, who are desecrating. Desecrating. The two, that's a reversal. It's not the righteous that are desecrating the idolaters. It's the idolaters who are desecrating the righteous. And God will come to their defense, as we will see. Uh, and then um, Mark 12, 8. And this, again, is a parable of the vineyard. Parable of the vineyard from Jesus. And it just it shows how disgraceful they treated the vineyard owner's son. Remember, he said, the vineyard said, I will send my son myself to them, and then they will do what they're supposed to do. 
Uh, so they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. I mean, I said, to, to those listening to this, that was a very extreme image of those who reject Jesus. Mm. Very extreme image. Uh, Jesus using hyperbola there to make his point. Using the hyperbola to make his point. Uh, in the Greek world, exposure of a body meant dishonor and exclusion from the underworld. We know that. Okay. All right, let's go then to the next verse. Any questions about that? Any questions? So now, here comes God to, to justify the witnesses, to heal them. And the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate exchange presents. That's a real part. Sorry, I hadn't gotten here yet. Because these two prophets have been a torment to the inhabitants of the earth. Okay, who are the inhabitants of the earth? They are non-believers, non-Christian believers. Non-Christian believers, that's everyone. Remember, we've seen this phrase before in Revelation, in our study. So inhabitants of the earth doesn't mean everyone in the earth. It means those who do not yet believe. This is a vision of the post-judgment. Okay? Of the post-return. We're not there yet in the vision. But the, I'm sorry, this is a prophecy of what's going to happen when the judgment occurs. So again, we're jumping chronology here. We're jumping chronology. In other words, we're not. This is not a trumpet. This is, this is a woe, but it's a woe way in the future. Okay. Joy and gift exchange are closely connected. And here's a picture uh, of a, a fresco, ancient one. They're exchanging gifts. Uh, in the Greco-Roman world, exchange of gifts expressed mutual obligation and was important to both public and private life. So the image here is not only one of celebration, it is of um, joining this group together. This, this group together who are gloating over the death of the two witnesses. It's joining them together into a, 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 a body. So the exchange of presence is not just an image of celebration. It is also an image of uh, mutual obligation. Uh, in ancient Israel, as in ancient Greece, Gift giving was associated with, here you go. What's that a scene of? The three kings. Huh? That the three kings? That's the Magi. And you only see two of them, right? This is from a very, this was taken from the year 300. Wow. 300 on the side of a sepulcher. And now I want to know, you, I want you to see why this is a really significant image. Look at Jesus. How old is he? That was the correct interpretation of the Greek. The word was not baby. The word was paidon, child. This is the correct interpretation. That's what the crash really, well, no, that means the crash didn't have the three king, or the three, the magi. And notice there's not three of them unless we're missing one. So, but that is 300 AD. That's getting back there, folks. That's getting back there. And like I said, the child is actually a child. A child. In Nazareth, not in Bethlehem. In Nazareth. And where was this found? This was on the side of a sepulcher. On the side of a Christian tomb. Yeah. I mean, I discovered this. I'm going, wow. I'm with you. I'm going, wow. I had not seen this before. Where was this tomb? Uh, I, I'd have to look that up. I'd have to look that up. Um, did I write it down? No, I didn't, but I'd have to. It's a sarcophagus. I apologize. I'm sorry. It's a sarcophagus. Look at, look at the dress. Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, they're dressed as Parthians, okay. not Persians. That's what I was getting. They're dressed as Parthians. It's completely different dress. Than completely different dress, exactly. Why Parthians? I can't answer that. But that's their, what they're wearing. The Parthians. Because the Parthians came from the east. Remember, they were the enemies of Rome in the east. Yeah. Now, that might have been a praise of the Parthians. We don't know. Because remember, Christians wanted, you know, the Christians praised the Parthians because they were judging Rome, as did many of the citizens of Israel. They liked the Parthians. The Romans were terrified of them. 
We talked about this before. But they are dressed as Parthians. Not as Persians. Parthians. That's so interesting, isn't it? Really is. Good point. Thank you for pointing out the dress. Exactly correct. That, that is so... This to me is one of the most interesting illustrations I've ever found in the New Testament time. Or even the hairdos. Yeah. Uh, are different, completely different from what we... Yeah. You know, when there's beards and all that. Kind of well, stuff. That, and again, the Parthians wore their hair. This is how the Parthians wore their hair. Long and up, that kind of thing. Yeah. We, we really get, this is really fascinating. This is really fascinating. The artist clearly understood the story this way. So. Because Joseph has facial hair. Yeah. And is in the, uh, the same way we would know he's dressed the same way as we would figure. And notice how, they, uh, I apologize, they don't beautify Mary. They don't beautify her. They just give her the face. But they don't beautify her like later does. She looks like a mother. Yeah, yeah. She looks like a mother. I don't know. Good question. This is a mystery. This this is a mystery. This is a mystery. Yeah. I'd love to find out more about it. I'd love to find out where it is. I know it's in the Roman world. I mean, it's somewhere around in the, that area. Asia Minor, probably. But I, I, I want to dig a little deeper into that uh, illustration, and I will. I will. Because um, it's really fascinating. Uh, and then Jesus' hair, the way it's styled. Um, Very fascinating. It's short. It's short. Could be, could be. Uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's really hard to tell how to portray it. And there's two, it looks like two gifts. But it could be three, but it looks like two gifts. It's exciting when we find these things. Because it gets us closer to how they viewed these events. Back, back, take a look at where Jesus VR in relationship to his body. And that'll tell you that he looks maybe six years old. Could be. Not three. Could be. Could be. He's, he's, look how long he is. Much older, yeah. I mean, it, it, like I said, we know Tidon can be anything from three to five to six easily. That word. So, I thought this is my favorite right now. Of all, of, all the illustrations I've found, this is my favorite. Yeah, yeah. That's why I love this stuff. I mean, it gets us, it's getting us, it gets us right there. Uh, ancient Israel, gift giving was associated with the birth of Christ. Oh, not the birth, I'm sorry. With the, with the running to Egypt. That's what it was associated with. Because the gifts enabled them to flee Herod. That's what the gifts were for. It enabled them to flee Herod. The betrothal, it was a gift giving was with betrothal and marriage. Uh, parents and children. If you look at Matthew 7 11, here's, here's Jesus in verse 10 using a. Uh, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So clearly, gift giving was for children as well. Uh, let me keep on moving along here. Yes. I want to get us to the end, at least in this chat, at least into this section here. Um, so now, now we see gift giving in the pagan world. This is the Saturnalia, and I'm laughing. Here's why I'm laughing. As you can see, what does that look like? Debauchery. Debauchery. Do you understand now why the Christian Church, when it became in power, turned that into Christmas? The Saturnalia was celebrated on the 25th. Yeah. So the church, in its brilliance, took these pagan celebrations and turned them into Christian celebrations. Because pagans, Gentile pagans, were flooding into the church. And they were bringing with them the debauchery. 
It's Saturnalia. No, it's not. It's Christmas. Wow. Yep, yep, yep. I know this is a modern interpretation, but pretty much that was the Saturnalia. Big, drunken party with an orgy going on where they uh, exchanged all kinds of gifts. Uh, and the Jewish festival of Purim involved gifts of food for one another and presents to the poor. I have Esther 9.22. Bottom of page 11. As the days on which the Jews gained relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow and gladness and from mourning into a holiday that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and presents to the poor. Presents to the poor. So uh, Purim is that kind of a festival. Uh, I don't know much about Purim except its relationship to Esther. I know something of that. Um, so any questions? Uh, oh yeah, one more thing. Prophets in the Greek is used here for the first time to ID the witnesses. It uses the actual word prophets, not the Greek word for witness. Up till this point, it calls them witnesses. Now it calls them prophets. Now, yeah, that's just a minor point. Somebody got their PhD on that, I'm sure. <laughs> but it makes the point that the two are the same. They're viewing here the two. This is a prophecy, not a vision. A prophecy. Okay. By the prophet. And, and, and it's about prophets. Okay. All right, here's verse 11. Um, but after three and a half days, now we see God stepping in. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and those who saw them were terrified. And there again is the resurrection connection. And three and a half, the times... Time and a half time. Okay. Three and a half days. Uh, part of this verse definitely refers to Ezekiel 37.10. So if you go to page 13. Wait, where'd it go? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Where'd 12 go? Do you see 12? Because I don't see 12. Yeah, there's 12 on the back of 11. On the back of 11. On the back of 11, yeah. At the very top, there's 11. Yeah. And it's Ezekiel if you're talking about 37.10. Uh, Esther's at the bottom. Yeah, I'm, I'm losing my mind. All I see is verse 12 on page 13. Oh, there it is. Well, there's verse, okay. Ezekiel, what was it? Nine, is there an Ezekiel 922? Does anybody see that? Uh, I'm just going to mess that up, good. Verse 11. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. I apologize. I got all mixed up. I thought it was in verse 12. Verse 11. Um, a part of this verse refers to Ezekiel 37.10. I prophesied as he commanded me, and that breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. That's the valley of the dry bones. Right. Um, and then that image of the breath of life. It's a phrase from Genesis. Genesis 1.30. And to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. Why is that important? Breath of life is a physical image, not a spiritual image. It's a physical image. This is a physical resurrection of their bodies that have the breath of life in them. That's really important. It's not a ghost, and it's not spiritual. Uh, so it goes really back into the Old Testament. Genesis 6, 17. For my part, I'm going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Genesis 6, 17. Um, there was a belief in the ancient Near East that the soul lingered, as I said, around the corpse for three days. This image of standing on one's feet is associated with resur physical resurrection. 2 Kings 13, 21. As the man was being buried, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. As soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he came to life and stood on his feet. Physical resurrection. Physical resurrection. Uh, uh, so we see that, and great fear fell upon them. This is the expression of awesome admiration for, for the Jews in the Old Testament. This is the world looking at the Jews in the Old Testament. This awesome admiration. 
If you look at Exodus 15, 16, terror and dread fell upon them. These are the nations. By the might of your arm, they became still a stone until your people, O Lord, passed by, until the people whom you acquired passed by. This is Exodus. And this is obviously the Egyptians who are in awe of what God has done for them. We see that same idea here. Uh, they stood on their feet, and those who saw them were terrified. They were in awe. Deuteronomy 11.25, no one will be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the fear and dread of you on all the land on which you set foot, as he promised you. And then also Esther 8.17, in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict came, there was gladness and joy among the Jews. A festival and a holiday. Furthermore, many of the peoples of the country professed to be Jews because the fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. Yeah, yeah. So, so, they, these are the nations. These are the nations here. Okay? Let's do verse 12 real quick. We're getting right toward the end here. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. A loud voice said, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud. Uh, we see this in an illustration I've used before, but here it is again. If you look, there they go. They are not spirits. They are physically being taken up to heaven. That's the whole point of this. That's the language that's being used here. Their bodies have been restored physically. Okay. And that's really important. Um, so voices from heaven we see often encouraging and strengthening the martyrs. And we saw that in the story of Stephen. We saw that as well. And we saw that in, uh, in any of the martyrs. Uh, the enemies of the martyrs observed their ascension into heaven, making this literally, literally a divine rescue. Clouds as a means of transport can be used in the Bible in, the Bible, in several different contexts. Clouds can be used for Yahweh to go around in heaven. From earth to heaven. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 on page 13. We're in verse 12 now. Then we who are alive, this is a rapture, who are left will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. By the way, this is called a rapture. This is called, from my introduction, this is called a rapture. A bodily resurrection is a rapture. Okay? Not the theological idea that's kind of in Christianity, but the idea of physical resurrection to heaven. You don't have to die. You're alive, you go to heaven. That's a rapture. Okay? That's a rapture. So we see that in Thessalonians. We see that in a means of transport. Oh, I'm sorry, the clouds as a means of transport from one part of heaven to another. Isaiah 19.1 See, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. So this is above Egypt. This is like God riding around on a cloud. As a means of transport from heaven to earth. Coming down. They, Luke 21.27 They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then in Revelation 14, this is an enthronement image. Then I looked and there was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to the one who sat on the cloud, use your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So the one who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was reaped. So it's an image of enthronement of Christ, enthronement of the Messiah. Uh, we've seen enthronement images earlier in Revelation. And then, of course, always, it's associated with theophanies. Leviticus 16.2, The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron not to come just at any time to the sanctuary inside the curtain before the mercy seat that is upon the ark, or he will die, for I appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Interesting that we use the contemporary image of communication in the cloud. Right. The cloud. And here's God in the cloud. I thought that interesting. 
I could preach that. I could preach that. I'd preach. That would preach. I don't know how long it would preach, but it would preach. Uh, okay, so uh, the clouds is the means transport. It is the bodies, not the souls, of the two prophets or witnesses that are taken up into heaven. Uh, there were many Jewish rapture stories. And we've heard them. Elijah goes up. Jeremiah goes up. So there are, there are usually associated with the prophet. Now, now, if the two witnesses represent Moses and Elijah having returned, if the two witnesses represent Moses and Elijah here, remember, Moses, there's no image of Moses going to heaven. He just dies and they bury him. Right? And they expect him to return. That's the Jewish theology. Elijah, same thing. Elijah is expected to return in body. So, if that's the case, then they reserve, then they get a second rapture. This time for their protection, rather than to wait for the end of the world. The idea was that they were waiting for the end of the world. Moses was waiting, Elijah was waiting. But here, they are taken up for their protection. If if these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah, and that's a big if. Because they could be associated with all kinds of real people. It, okay, so, so, so um, the notion that the righteous went to heaven is not seen in Judaism. Because heaven is not considered the abode of the righteous. Yeah. Uh, Shoal was the abode. There was a section in Shoal for the righteous. That's how they looked at it. So everyone went to Shoal, this place, but there was a special section for the righteous. That's in Jewish theology and in Jewish apocalypse. That idea of going to heaven is a Christian idea brought to us by Jesus who said we will be, who said to his followers, you will be with me. You will be with me in the Is kingdom. that where purgatory came from? They took, Roman Catholicism took the concept of Shoal and turned it into purgatory. Yeah. As a means of springing, you know, when a coin in the plate rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Pretty good trick, by the way. <laughs> well, the idea of the bank, the heavenly bank, and, and the idea of remember, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna say Roman Catholicism. They they're not word centered. They are tradition centered. Still to this day, they're tradition centered. So they interpret this way, and that then becomes the tradition. And they're not word centered. Okay, it's just like two different things totally. Okay, words interpreted by anointed leadership. That's the thing. Whereas we don't have that structure of anointed. We have ordained leadership, but not directly anointed as a conduit of God's, of God's will. Not word, but will. That's kind of the idea. I do not want to get into Roman Catholic theology because I don't know enough about it. Um, but Again, in Judaism, the notion that, that the righteous went to heaven is just not seen. It's just not there. Uh, okay, if you look at 606, it is a Christian notion. Uh, it is a Christian notion, which may indicate that they're talking about Peter and Paul here as the two witnesses who were beheaded. This is the beheading, or the, the tradition is they were beheaded. This is an image of the beheading of Peter and Paul. Um, and uh, so... So that image, it could be the two witnesses are meant to be Peter and Paul. Mm. Being used for the end time. Or symbolically, too. I mean, you know. Because we can't think of any other two, wit two of that time that were martyred together. Prominent. Two Christian leaders. And the two apostles were supposedly killed together during the Neuronic uh, persecution. 
Remember, Paul was making his way to Rome to witness to Nero when we last see him. And it was believed that Peter was in Rome organizing the church. And they were both caught up in it and executed. That's the idea. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so, so the idea of witnesses, of being witness to an ascension, is common in the scriptures. And, of course, this is the very famous passage. Uh, if you look on your page, i got to roll it over. Oh, this is the last, we're getting to the last page of scripture. Second Kings, as they continue, on top of page 14, as they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended into the world and into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. So there's a witness. And then in Acts 1, 9 through 10, when he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up. And a cloud, there's transport, took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes divided. This is the ascension of Christ. But this, and, and so the question is, you know, is the ascension of Christ a rapture? Or was Christ spiritual, a kind of spiritual image? It's a bodily resurrection. It's really important in Christian theology. That it was, that's why, touch my hands, touch my side. See, it's me. It was a bodily resurrection. So it was a rapture. It was a rapture. Um, the same motif occurs in Greco-Roman accounts. Uh, witnesses claim that deceased Caesars had ascended into heaven. The death of Romulus. Here's this image. And you'll see there's, this is the death of Romulus. And here's the image of the gods coming down to get him and take him up. So, so that idea of, of a bodily resurrection or bodily ascension. Uh, Jim, this is an image in the Roman world of Romulus being transported to wherever they're taken. To uh, Olympus or whatever, we don't know. So, so that idea was in the Greek and Roman world, certainly. The idea of uh, uh, witnesses seeing, and then the witnesses claim that the sea Caesars had ascended into heaven. But people kind of went, no, they didn't. I mean, back then they went, no, no. Caesar did not do that. So it was like one witness, and they're not going to accept the word one witness, saying that Augustus went that was bodily risen, you know. Because they did not like the idea of, a, of, of the emperor being a god. They really did not particularly the, those in the Republic, those who are strong for the Republic. You know. So, uh, let's then go to the last verse. At that moment, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and this is really important. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Remember, this is the only place in Revelation where those who are being punished uh, uh, are repent. And it's representatives from around the world. That's important. And what did they witness? They witnessed an ascension and a judgment. An ascension and a judgment. Uh, uh, the, there's this immediacy of divine retribution uh, uh, for what they did to the witnesses, for leaving, you know, just for, for stoning them. The immediacy of divine retribution. The earthquake related to the death of Jesus is a parallel. I won't read it. You know that story. Here the earthquake represents a punishment rather than a theophany. In the death of, in the, in the death of Jesus on the cross, it's a theophany, not a punishment. It is God has come down. The earthquake. But here it's a punishment. Jerusalem is represented as still existing when the earthquake strikes. So the city still exists. The population of Jerusalem before AD 66 is estimated to be between 55,000 and 95,000. Here, the number is 70,000. Uh, if you add it all up, what the, you know, 
uh, a tenth of the city fell, 7,000 people were killed. And that's an actual, accurate, fairly accurate census of pre-70 Jerusalem in 66. It was estimated to be 70,000 people. That's pretty accurate. I mean, not 70, I'm sorry. Between 55 and 90,000. So that's pretty darn close. Uh, they glorified God, an acclamation common to the New Testament, especially in Luke Acts. Uh, in Luke Act 3 9, all the people saw him walking and praising God, glorifying God, praising God. Um, so, what does give glory to God mean? What does it mean here? The rest were terrified and gave glory to God. What does it mean? Well, it can mean several things, and we're going to conclude with this today. One, it means to tell the truth. Look at John 9, 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. Tell us the truth. We know that this man is a sinner. So it means to tell the truth. And of course, it means to give praise and honor to God. We saw that in Luke. It's also a verbal expression of conversion. As I said, this is the only instance in Revelation of people turning to God as a result of a punitive Miracle. It's also an image of the conversion of a Judaic remnant, which is predicted in Romans 11, 25 through 26. Take a look. So that you may not claim to be wiser than you are, brothers and sisters. This is Paul. I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. And the, word, the Greek is all Israel will give glory to God. That's the Greek. As it is written, out of Zion will come the deliverer. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. So there's that, that idea of a remnant giving glory to God in Jerusalem or of the Jewish people represented there. Uh, and then verse 14, which is our last verse, and, I'll, and, and this is a, obviously a transitional verse. The second woe has passed the third woe is coming very soon. And I put up here a little slide of there's the there's the uh, eagle, and those words are woe woe, but he has, but he's not claiming the third woe yet. So this is kind of a image of this point of everything going on. It's a kind of a wrap up image. Okay, good, we're done. So so uh, any questions or thoughts before we. Finish chapter 11, which is only three verses. So, so when we come back, it's going to be a short intro. It's really short. Three verses. Uh, and it's a throne room vision of back to the elders, praising God, and all the stuff again. Okay. It's transitional. Then in chapter 12, we get back into the seventh trumpet sounding. And guess what follows that? The seven bowls suddenly appear. So now we've got to go through seven bowls. Thank you, John. But the seven bowls is the end of it. That's when the Jesus comes on the horse and finishes everything up. It's all done. And then begins the celebration. And the new Jerusalem descends from heaven. And heaven and earth are one. Really interesting. Okay. So uh, any questions about what we looked at today? I thought it was fascinating, some of this. It really is. Um, and I know, I don't want you to get bored from the references to the verses, but you've got to understand, everything in John comes from something else. These images were not made up. They refer to things. And that's why people really, you, you can't read Revelation without understanding where it comes from. Then you understand it. When I say understand it, then you at least get how it was read. So, on a symbolic level, in a, in a past and present and future level. Any questions or thoughts? Well, let's have a word of prayer. No class next week. We'll have a word of prayer and uh, go safely. And Jim, we're praying for you. Lord, we pray you'd be with us. We especially lift up our brother Jim before you as he, fit, as he goes to surgery next Wednesday that you would be in the hands of the doctors and the nurses that care for him, that the surgery will go well, that it will relieve any suffering, and that, Lord, he'll feel all the prayers 
on that day that are being said for him and in the recovery to come. So help him to feel the prayers of this class and be with us, Lord, while we're away from each other and bring us safely to return to continue the study after our time apart. It is in your holy and wonderful name that we pray.